before this lecture today, 23, I wanted to go over some points that I, some fun questions that have been given to me by uh, students, um, indicate that I need to be a little clearer on some points, particularly this pi over 2 phase that uh, shows up in, uh, and this is an old program here uh, that uh, <coughs> is running on an old machine, but uh, I'm just going to do the current thing. It has a Stokes vector that we'll talk more about today, but it has two pendulums <coughs> down on the, the uh, one that's uh, sitting there on the overhead projector. And it's this 90 degree phase lag between uh, when for this, uh, this is a B type um, that's bilaterally symmetric um, pendulum system. And it's essentially uh, the one that we did first in the uh, analysis where the half difference beat frequency shows up. In other words, the beats that are forming there in green are just made by this particular uh, x versus y, or x1 versus x2 plot. Just saying it's this plot right here. And it, the uh, um, main idea that you, you, you see is this pi over 2 makes sense physically. Just as this thing passes the origin, this one is at its maximum. <coughs> So it's kind of like a dance. It's uh, come on, baby, give, give some uh, momentum, maximum possible momentum by being at the at the at the most stretched position just as it passes. And you can see from the clocks that 90 degrees is there. You can also see it. And I didn't emphasize this very much, but you should notice that when we did this factoring of the sum of the two phasers into uh, a group wave, which is real, but was an envelope of that. That's the envelope that's in green dots there. And that's the one that's tracking at the difference over two frequency. Uh, the phase, which is the uh, guts of the wave, the oscillation, the heartbeat, you might say, uh, of this, the, uh, that, uh, comes out to give you uh, as we use this formula, this factoring formula first on the sum and then on the difference uh, of the uh, phasers that are responsible for a symmetric mode that's plus and plus, a uh, plus an anti-symmetric mode that's plus and minus. So this one factors into a cosine and this one factors into a sine, but more to the point, it factors into I times the sine. So there's your 90 degree phase right there uh, of that particular second component uh, compared to, that's this guy right here, compared to this one. And that's maintained until um, it's time to uh, trade positions here. So that at this point, now this little guy here is being driven by this one, whereas before uh, this was the driver and that was the one that was being built up to make up what's going off screen right now. And this particular uh, operation runs out of memory at that point, but that's fine. Um, we'll talk more about the Stokes vector and all of that today. But I, I thought you ought to see uh, how uh, prevalent and important this is. So. Uh, what I'm showing here is uh, uh, it's called bore it after Niels Bohr. And uh, I'm going to turn the thing uh, into the ground state. So this is a ground state of a wave that consists of two wells. And we're going to discuss uh, this with regard to the ammonia molecule, uh, which has a, a nitrogen that goes through a triangle of hydrogens. And it sits on this side for a while, and then it comes over on this side and back. The so-called ammonia inversion or nitrogen inversion thing is responsible for what I talked about just at the end of the last lecture. That's the beginning of the major and laser revolution. So what I've got here is the ground state. The real part, dark line. Imaginary part, a, a shaded thing. 
Imagination always precedes reality by one quarter. That's a rule in business, but it's absolutely the rule here uh, for waves and oscillations in, in uh, any sort of wave system, but particularly a quantum mechanical one. So this is the ground state right here, and then very uh, just a pixel above that in terms of energy, to really close. Uh, this is a doublet. You can see the doublets clearly here. These two levels have about two pixels between them. Uh, the next one is a pair that has about uh, uh, seven or eight pixels uh, on this uh, coarse screens uh, uh, graphic. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put together a linear combination of the symmetric state. That's the state that corresponds to the mode that uh, we talked about with the pendulum that is uh, uh, symmetric. And it's pretty obvious mode that if I go like this, and get them right on the thing. That mode goes forever if there were no friction. And then we're going to, I'm going to add to that uh, the opposite mode, that is the one, and I have to be a little careful here to get them more or less on the same thing. That one also goes forever, but at a higher frequency because now it's restretching the spring. The other one wasn't. Activating the coupling makes the frequency go up most, most of the time. So, if I don't trip over my wires, what I'm going to do is actually I'll perform that uh, sum here uh, by uh, simply starting the phaser, just click on it and it stops. Um, what I want to do is put this thing here at a, about 90 degrees to the other one. And if I do that, or if I go the other way, I can make it this way. I want to start on the right-hand side uh, with all of the amplitude, or practically all of the amplitude, um, in the, uh, the right-hand well, a left-hand well, one, one toward me. Okay, so I try to get this thing uh, as close to that as, as possible. I think I'm pretty close there. Let's just go ahead with it, and you'll see that this is, this is what's called tunneling in quantum mechanics. Tunneling because it's a beat that's really slow. And you can see this one right here is 90 degrees. All of these phasers here are 90 degrees ahead of that one, and they maintain that, just like it does in these simple mechanical uh, two-phaser uh, uh, simulations. So this one is driving this one and continues to drive it at a constant rate, maintains that 90-degree phase lag and continues sneaking over to the other side uh, through the evanescent part of the wave. I think anybody who works with quantum mechanics should see this. Because this is what happens in all of the resonances that make up our world, our universe, at the fundamental level. There we are, so to zero right there, and it's going to come back now. This one is leading this one by 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that cool? And it's not just the two uh, levels on the ground state. All of them do this. Every, every transition of two levels does something like this. Some of them not so uh, uh, big as others because of symmetry selection rules and things like that that just cancel the effect out. But um, that is what we're dealing with. That's what I think this mechanical analog is really important. And we've already discussed how the equations of motion for a two-state system of that mechanical thing are identical to a two-state quantum system. Even if you're dealing with hundreds or millions or continuum of phasers. Okay? All right. Now, there's one more thing I want to point out, and I went over it too quickly. Uh, uh, when we uh, had it, and so I'm going to switch over to uh, this computer from this one. It was just stopped anyway, so let me switch uh, this one uh, to the modern uh, computer. And this is part of lecture 21. Okay, and I won't even bother to start playing it. I'll just leave the uh, thing here so I can manipulate it. But the basic idea to think about these uh, phasers and how they interfere is to just say that you're in some kind of, of time gauge 
that's the name that's used when you uh, add or subtract a frequency from all of the frequencies in the system. Now we have two frequencies here. This thing has a certain frequency uh, that's probably lower than the anti-symmetric phaser uh, a mode. So this guy goes faster than this one. It's a low frequency thing. Why not just subtract enough, take this one frequency away from this one, make this one the difference in the frequency. So that's what this drawing does. It just simply imagines what's going to happen if I leave uh, these things at zero. So I'm going to leave that guy alone and let these guys turn. Okay? And we start off with them canceling each other. This is just a one twelfth of a beat period into the uh, thing that we're trying to show here. And as soon as I uh, move this guy over here to 1230, this thing which used to be at 6 o'clock is moved up to 630. When you add the two, you get a little uh, vector right there. And that vector is perpendicular to the vector that we get by summing. This is the same, uh, uh, you might call it a force parallelogram, okay, but it's not, it's a phasor parallelogram. Okay? And so the diagonal of this one, the long diagonal, is this vector, and it is perpendicular to the diagonal that's a small diagonal. It's just growing while this one is going to be shrinking. Okay, so that's what happens. And you start off with this situation where there isn't anything here and it's all on this side. That's the perfect resonance. And uh, you go uh, to the next uh, thing. I think I could just do this and get the thing uh, to move in time. So there's the picture of those two uh, phasers. And then we go a little further, say one sixth of a, uh, a period. Okay. Now uh, this one is a little bigger. This one doesn't look like it's changed much, but the area that comes out of this, the action that comes out of this, goes into this. So the sum of those areas is a constant. That's a one of you know. It's one of that's part of this oscillator thing we didn't mention before, but it's kind of obvious from the algebra. But it, 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 it's it, it, it bears saying, okay, so it's as though there's an incompressible fluid, uh, and if I uh, squeeze it out of here, this thing starts off, because the area that this thing has gained is equal to the area this thing has lost. Okay, so once you get uh, a, a, a little bit further there, and I'll just do this one more here, you get to the point where if they're both equal, then you have this situation. Now. If it's optics we're talking about, and I'm making a big pitch for that uh, that idea, I'm making it uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very important to uh, talk about that because optics is becoming so powerful and so uh, prevalent, and there are all sorts of different kinds of optics, and uh, probably it is a good time for me to go ahead and play this one so you can see what I'm talking about here. This right here is x-polarization. This is after quarter wave plate, okay, that's left circular polarization, and you saw that evolving out of the plane polarization. So that's quarter wave plate in optics, and then you go to the half wave plate, and you've turned X polarization into Y polarization. And you probably have learned that if you did any optics, wave optics uh, in a course, but it's, it's, that's another example of what we're talking about here. Okay? Um, that's kind of the review uh, that I wanted you to see before we, we dive into some pretty uh, complicated algebra uh, that has to do with uh, this lecture 23. Okay, I'm going to uh, freeze this guy because it's an old machine. It gets tired when it gets fire. We don't want that. Um, I'm going to uh, bring this guy uh, back up to match uh, lecture 23 there. Should be showing up very quickly. That's it. Okay, so we're ready to go. If I go ahead and also uh, bring this one uh, up, which I've already done, and I've started playing it, uh, but it's the wrong lecture, so I'm going to get out of there, I'm going to escape from that, and go over to um, the 23rd uh, lecture, which should be waiting here with bated breath. Okay, there's 23 right there, and I will uh, begin with that one. 
I'm going to do the same thing with this one uh, to get on track here uh, for today's uh, exposition. So let's uh, go here and uh, look at the window. No, I don't want to do that. I just want to look at the window that has lecture 23 hiding under it. And that is right there. Okay. Now, uh, we've got to say more about this gadget because this is the uh, thing that really is a mechanical analog uh, for all of the geometry that the um, two-level system has. I mean, it's also a good way to learn about, uh, we're going to be having a rotational chapter, very brief one in, in this course, that's uh, unit six. Uh, at that point, Euler angles, that's what these are, are important. So one of the things we've got to do here that involves a good deal of algebra is connect the Euler angles, those little dials there, alpha, beta, and gamma, uh, to the angles that describe an uh, operator of rotation. And those are, I've given the name Darboo angles or axis angles. Darboo is a geometry that uh, uh, figured out a lot of stuff about uh, rotations. Uh, from, actually, it's a differential geometry. So, uh, after we've done that, then I want to go through once again uh, the B balanced uh, resonances, but we'll also see the same thing happens for A type. And if you look carefully, it happens for C type. And then there are the mixed A and B, and then the, the really weird stuff is when you put all three of them together. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing today. And, and while I'm at it, I'm emphasizing this field that I, I see bur burgeoning. Um, I mean, it has been behind the, the scenes, so to speak, and done a lot of good things for us. Almost all the spectroscopy that I work with wouldn't be around if we didn't have that. But ellipsometry, the study of ellipses, okay, but optical ones. So uh, I, I want to make connections to that uh, today as well. So um, lots of, uh, of uh, um, links here. All of the links for the different types are right here, uh, but they'll be on the pages that are, are relevant uh, for the discussion uh, that we're going to be doing. So um, let's make sure uh, everything's working here. And uh, that's the first topic there is Euler angles. And this is to review. I um, make sure that uh, you see uh, what they are um, in terms of dials. Okay, so this sort of exposes the dials that are uh, on the gadget here. That's kind of blurred out so you don't see it very well there. But the Euler angles, um, uh, alpha for azimuth, beta uh, for the theta. Beta and theta rhyme alpha just stands for azimuth, but that would have been phi if you were doing ordinary polar coordinates. And then you never get to the third polar coordinate. It has to do with an actual rigid object rather than just a vector. And that's the, the gamma. And it turns out to be quantum phase, at least proportional uh, to quantum phase. OK, uh, it's those angles that we need to connect to whatever uh, operation it took uh, to, um, to uh, uh, produce a, a given rotational state or ro uh, position, rotational position. We need to say what operator uh, was needed to, to get uh, to a particular uh, state. And we're, we're doing it in a quantum mechanical sense because orientations and angles uh, are the things that define the spin state. Okay, so remember that the first thing we have to do with this device, if we're going to be aiming things with it, uh, is uh, apply the uh, crank in the Z direction to set the, uh, the uh, uh, phase angle, the gamma angle, the polar angle that, uh, it, uh, the, that is the azimuthal angle for uh, some aliens or the quantum aliens that live on this sphere, that live within this state, okay? Uh, Let's uh, say they have a, 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 a azimuth uh, that is called gamma, and then we, Earthlings, share this angle with them, then uh, 
the azimuth uh, that we do in the last step here, the third rotation, is the one that's at the very base here. Uh, that is set again by a Z crank, a rotation around the Z of our uh, axis. So the other axes, the axes that belong to the uh, rotating body are in principle never seen again in the location for uh, Y and Z. And the uh, Y uh, rotation is the one that sets the beta or theta angle. Okay, well when you do that in the spinner world, with all these complex uh, rotations. And uh, uh, one of the things I, I point out to you right away is that there is a reason why uh, we pick Y, that's, that's our C, okay, uh, uh, the curly complex that uh, Coriolis uh, uh, <coughs> current carrying uh, uh, operator uh, that uh, we, uh, they say makes things go, so we color it green. Uh, this uh, 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 operation right here is real. It's not diagonal like these two, and that's the thing that's cool about the Z, is that in less arithmetic, if you do this guy be Z, this guy be Y, it's not diagonal, but it's not complex. And the arithmetic, keeping the arithmetic down here, you see, and then you come back to this one. It's diagonal, makes it simple multiplication, but it is complex. Well, the whole thing comes out to be the complex components in all four places. And it's the first column of this, the one that acts on the initial spin-up state. And we're letting it have some arbitrary amplitude because this is uh, useful for classical oscillation analysis if this were <coughs> Quantum mechanics, this would be a one. But there are four parameters here at all times, and that's one of them. And uh, here, uh, I get this vector right here just by looking at the first column, the one that multiplies that. And then I pull out, each one of these has an e to the i minus sine gamma, minus sine gamma. So I factor that out. There's your overall phase sitting right there. Then your relative phase is called the, the coherence angle. Alpha is right here. Alpha is the azimuth of this spin that's going to be flopping around in, around some axis. Some axis made by a crank that's pointed somewhere, and that crank is what we have to uh, relate to uh, uh, to this particular set of, of uh, product rotations. Okay, I'm not keeping up uh, too well. Uh, here, but we're only one step behind. So let's get it and get that uh, in all places. Okay, so now I want to, this, this stuff I want to be clear. If you've got questions, get them out. Uh, this is, you know, gets a little hairy. Okay, okay I've got a question. Yes. Why are we, why is it just Z, Y, Z? Why not X? I guess it's arbitrary, but. Um, I would say it is arbitrary but you want to keep the arithmetic down. And X is a complex, undiagonal operation. Don't want to, be, don't want to you know, have it clut, clut, clutter up your program, right? But right. obviously we're doing all this on a computer, right, in the modern age. But it used to be we had to write it out, right? And it really made you uh, cognizant that the, the Y is special. You see the generator of Y is totally imaginary. And then you put an I on that, you got something that's totally real. Does that explain yeah. as best I can mm -hmm. uh, uh, for, for that? Another uh, thing that I might say is, why is the thing that makes things go? Okay. So it's appropriate to use it, um, even when you're just the thing making it go. Oh, great. Um, okay. Now this part right here is a bunch of quadratic forms. Let's just look at that. Uh, this again, uh, something I went over pretty fast when we did it. But the basic idea here is that if this was classical physics, this is just a a <laughs> a one and a two. The amplitude number one, the amplitude number two. It happens to, with our craziness with phasers, b an x plus i p number one and x plus i p number two, and there they are. That's that's where you get what x1 is in terms of 
of the uh, real part of this collection here. You got to put them close together, and then this is the real part of this one right here with that thing attached. As it was, and uh, then the imaginary part is uh, what we call the, the momentum, and that you get from pulling it. So that's one of the first things we're going to do uh, to get uh, you know a feeling for uh, what um, the X's and P's are really doing. But here. Instead of uh, just uh, writing all this stuff out, I'm just going to put the A's where they belong. There's a, a kit bra uh, thing. So we're making a quadratic form here that measures, this is a, a kind of a measurement, this is kind of an expectation value. This is, when you do this in quantum mechanics, it's an expectation value. But what we're getting here is actually a number that characterizes the asymmetry of this state. So uh, putting that thing with this, giving me uh, a combination like that, and then I go ahead and write out what those are. I come up here with a difference between sort of the total energy of the number one component and the total energy of the number two component. Now, the K, the mass, uh, maybe omega squared, uh, all of that stuff has been subsumed into one. So we're just getting x squared plus momentum squared for number one and x squared plus momentum uh, number two uh, uh, squared with a minus sign. Well, sticking the values you get from here into that gives you uh, that expression right there. Now this is a half angle expression, cosine half minus sine squared half, just cosine. So this thing comes out to give you the polar angle of the spin vector. That's what the uh, asymmetry is. You get more and more asymmetry as you keep increasing that, roughly speaking. Okay, that's the number uh, expectation if you want, but it's, it's more like a classical label, some, something that is, is conserved under certain conditions, which you'll see uh, maybe later on. This one I call balance. It's just a, a, a sigma that goes with a bilaterally balanced. This is how much balance you have. Uh, I, I use the balance a sigma right here, okay? And uh, all of these things have one half on it because we are thinking about the, the, the world where it, it sees spin as, a, as a having a half. And then finally, well, this one comes out uh, a little bit more complicated, but it just comes out to the second polar coordinate that we're using. That would really be the first polar coordinate uh, that uh, normally uh, you would uh, uh, be dealing with, actually it's, it, 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 it is the second, it is, this one would be the uh, first one, the sine, both of these are sine beta uh, here in this half angle business, and then this one is the azimuth of uh, alpha, the cosine and the sine. So this is just polar coordinates that you should be used to, okay? There's the azimuth right there, there's the beta, and then the twist of this thing, that's the uh, new wrinkle here. This, this little twist keeps track of the phase, so this pile of aluminum and uh, copper uh, and all kinds of other uh, metals, and classical metals, is uh, describing uh, the uh, geometry and topology in a spinner space, a quantum spinner space. So I, I say that's cool. Okay. That's cool to have that mechanics uh, to look at and play with. Now here are a whole bunch of other ways to look at things, and that's a, well, I'm selling you, but here are the other ways that people have been looking at them. Occasionally this, but more likely, they just plot the real part of the phase first of the uh, components, the X1 and the X2, just plot that. And that gives you usually an ellipse somewhere, in general. It might just give you a line like that, that's a degenerate ellipse, and another one like that, that's what you get in the A-type uh, situations. But uh, in, ge in general, polarization is elliptical for pure, um, pure uh, polarization state of light. This one is a spinner picture. It's got all the information, but it's these darn phasers. They're not so easy to decipher sometimes. And then, of course, there's a three-dimensional real picture that that spin vector represents. And now it re is represented by something that is keeping track of the gamma. But you should be uh, aware that when you uh, make psi star or psi star psi uh, products, 
you kill the phase. The gamma does not show up in that equation. It only shows up inside for the people, the, the, the aliens riding this, uh, whatever quantum system that is. Um, and they don't, they can't see the alpha. It goes away. All right? This is a weird fairy tale, isn't it? <laughs> but that's, uh, nature's kind of, kind of like this. Okay, now, um, using that, and we'll, and we'll have some of this later on, <clears throat> every possible ellipse, whatever it's, whether it's degenerate, whether it actually makes a circle, it's a C-type thing, or it's up like this, or tipped, whatever angle it is, uh, these angles are important. Uh, this angle right here that tracks uh, the major axis, uh, 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 I should say, attracts the aspect ratio of the ellipse uh, relative to a, uh, a, a coordinate system. Uh, this one right here that tracks, uh, let's see if I've got, uh, there's another one here that I should be pointing out. That's uh, this guy right here, uh, this angle right here to the axis of the ellipse. I would call that the Faraday angle because Faraday is the one that discovered uh, that um, certain sugars, levulose or dextrose, rotate the polarization of light when they're in the water because they are right-handed and left-handed sugars and the light responds to that. So uh, how much do you rotate? That depends on the density of the sugar, all kinds of things. That's chemists do this all the time, okay, looking at the uh, through a polarimeter. That's the beginning of use of polarization for something that you, you can't see other ways uh, easily. So uh, that angle doubled is the azimuth angle of the spin vector, the Stokes vector, the S vector. Okay, I say the Stokes uh, after John Stokes. 1863, he's already got this in his head in a paper uh, that describes uh, this sort of geometry in a real three-dimensional space leaves a uh, complex space behind. A single point in this space on the sphere, assuming the amplitude hasn't uh, degenerated, and that can, so that's part of the thing. There are four parameters, not just these angles, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, but also the amplitude uh, makes four. And uh, that describes all possible uh, polarization states. But you, it, what's kind of neat to have all of this complexity here represented by a single point on a sphere, by a single S vector, okay? And that S vector is inside this sphere right here. That's the S vector tip right there uh, that uh, we would be drawing up uh, on the graph like that, okay? All right. Any, any other, I mean, thank you for the question. But if it's making sense, we're gonna go on, okay? This is just another picture of the same thing. Complex space, the real thing, the real thing. And unless you do this funny thing with that gamma, you've lost a, 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 a parameter here. Okay, let's get both of these up to speed here. And here's where uh, we look closely at the angles uh, that uh, uh, make up uh, a cogent theory for Stokes and there are other contributors, the Mueller space, the, uh, the whole bunch of people that worked on polarization and each of them sort of did it a differently, just of Johnny come lately with these gadgets. And uh, the basic idea is to realize that the polar coordinates of the spin vector and I'm just imagining that spin vector sort of sticking out here, and maybe the amplitude is where we're going to determine uh, the length of that uh, uh, thing, but the orientation of it is determined uh, by uh, these angles here. This is only the thing that changes the orientation when you apply it uh, to that sphere. And it has three angles as well. The three angles are italic phi, axis angle, uh, you might call it the omega axis azimuth, 
and the omega axis is this axis right here that actually has the crank on it you're going to turn uh, to rotate uh, the, this thing and all of these angles by alpha, beta, and gamma have to respond to that in a fairly complicated manner which we're about to calculate. Then there's a polar angle, an italic theta, so we have a we have phi and theta now that you're used to, but I'm doing it in italics because um, we use the actual raw thing, thetas and phi's for other things. Uh, in any case, that angle right there is the polar angle. It's measured off of the pole. And it has a um, complement that we often use uh, too. So uh, the third angle in this case is how much are you cranking it. This is the one that is going to be turned by time. In this situation where our A, B, C, and D are constants of the Hamiltonian, this thing right here will be uh, the thing that makes the state do all of the dancing that we were seeing uh, when we did those animations. Okay, so the question is, how do we do this? Now you have to realize that these are really convenient parameters, these blue things, the ones that are attached to the crank. We're describing an operation that places a particular position of the Euler angle. So these guys right here, these alpha betas, they're very good coordinates of the spin state. So they're kind of the things that you look at first because if, you, if I give you these, I can picture where this thing is fairly quickly. There's a polar angle, there's the azimuth. Oh, and you want to twist a little bit? Okay, there's the gamma the, for the phase. So we have to relate these three angles to these three. That is, what crank got us to that particular state from zero, zero, zero? That's what we need to know. Okay. Now, actually, I should have remembered to set this thing up for uh, that particular demonstration, but um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take some time. Okay, so um, here is the calculus of that. It's simply the amount of taking this gamma, beta, alpha product, okay? That's the whole matrix there. We only use the first column to make the state. Well, that's useful right away. That, that just, that part of the calculation is great. But also, uh, here are the components in terms of, well, there's the bilaterally symmetric guy that Pauli would call X. I put it in the first position to respect uh, Pauli and Jordan. Then uh, the next guy right here is the Y. That's the one we call sigma C. And then finally sigma A, that's our first. That's our first. That's Z, okay? Our, our first is their last. So we always have this little cyclic uh, switcheroo. Uh, and then the coefficients of each of those are relative. Now I should point out, um, well maybe I'll wait, but the thing called a density matrix uh, using um, alpha, beta, and gamma is, is of use, and that's at the very end of this lecture. We won't get to it, but I just mentioned it now. If you want to learn about the block approach to spin, it's a couple of pages, but it's at the very end. It's not part of this course, really. It's that's pure quantum mechanics, the master equation that lets the quantum probability be mixed up with noise and uh, classical uh, things uh, and uh, is very powerful uh, for uh, a lot of stuff that goes on around in this laboratory. Okay, so as I point out, the Euler angles make better coordinates. It lets us uh, uh, a state of it, the definition of that is going to be relating uh, the alpha beta, gamma, two, phi, uh, theta, italic theta, and uppercase uh, theta. Those are the darbu or axis angles, theta axis angles, crank angles. This is a crank, okay? <clears throat> and so am I, I guess, in certain ways, do all this stuff, okay? So um, that is what we need to uh, make a connection to. Now, uh, the actual uh, steps of going through, through this are um, pretty easy. Let's make sure that the physics names of these things are there. The overall phase, that's the thing that's 
outside of this thing, okay, the gamma, okay, that, that, that is the, well, it's essentially the Berry phase. And then uh, this guy right here, the coherence angle, okay, and that is the uh, azimuthal angle of a phaser that this thing would make if uh, all the spin vector did was wiggle a little bit, would go out to about here and then go around. The phaser, the shadow of that on this dial right here, would be the classical phaser of this oscillation that's happening from transition. So before we got into quantum optics and started turning the, the uh, whole phaser picture upside down, inverting the population, uh, you start with the ground state, uh, and then it's 100% in the ground state, and the uh, uh, action of this, uh, of any light you can say, it's a classical light, not coherent light, uh, makes it wiggle just a little bit, a little tiny bit, okay? And um, we've got some picture uh, from that when we were talking about resonance, just the ordinary resonance that we did in the first lecture for oscillation, is that, it just does that, and then you go away and it dies out. That's the you, what we used to have to do. We discovered laser. Laser is capable of taking that thing and making it a big spiral and turning the whole thing upside down. That's called inversion of population. You can actually create all of the probability out of the ground state into the excited state. So we do in this laboratory, <laughs> okay, a lot of the time. So. That, I, I point out, is that alpha sitting here and here is the coherence angle for a classical phaser that you would use if you didn't have the laser turning the thing upside down. You wouldn't have to worry about this with equal to one. There'd be a very slight population down here, uh, sine beta. Okay, so uh, here's the first step, first two steps uh, for uh, doing the uh, connection. We just basically take the x1 and the p1 and the x2 and the p2, I do it in this order because it turned out to work out pretty uh, nicely. Uh, and there's this guy uh, there. Okay, so we already have two equations now uh, relating these um, things. Th this is a funny kind of polar coordinates that we're getting here, x1, p2, made of combinations of alpha and gamma and uh, sine cosine of beta. Um, the uh, next one involves x2 and then the uh, fourth one involves uh, p2. So little lines show you where I got these, but um, that's what we have to solve. That is the uh, uh, thing that's going to give us the relationships. Now notice what th this, and I probably have to go over here to point at it, um, notice these funny kind of polar coordinates we have here, um, and I'm making sure I have four things, yes. Uh, we start with just cosine theta over 2, that's an easy one, uh, just from x1, uh, cosine of uppercase uh, theta over 2, and then the next one that you have is cosine of the theta times the sine of big theta over 2. And then all the rest of them have a sine here, and then this cosine uh, right here changes to a sine as well, and then you have a sine and cosine there. So this is kind of a four-dimensional polar coordinates. This is weird. This is a U2 cross U2 um, polar coordinates. So there, there's two kinds of polar coordinates that we're kind of trying to relate here. That's a mathematical um, kind of way to say uh, what it is we're, we're doing. So, let's do it. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. This is the set of equations that have been doing there. And that's what we're going to play. Uh, I'll go ahead and put it on this screen as well. And there's the first result. I now have the sum of ga alpha and gamma in terms of the cosine of beta italic and the uh, crank angle uh, tangent over two, angle over two, okay? And uh, these uh, come about just uh, by looking at those equations and pulling, pulling the uh, answers out. So I'm gonna let you go and trace through this, play with it a little bit. Uh, we'll be 
uh, not in this particular problem set that you gave given today, but later on, uh, we'll be making use of this. But I'm going to go ahead and test this. This is what is really important here: is to test the relations that we're we're getting Euler angles in terms of Darboux angles. Okay. So here's alpha and gamma in terms of it takes all three to make each one of those. So those are um, azimuthal Euler uh, angles. Uh, the beta, that comes fairly easily from a relation to trace of the dotted lines there uh, to get that. But uh, there is a complete set of a, of a conversion to alpha, beta, and gamma from the crank angles. Now, the, uh, obviously, the inverse is needed here, and it's not uh, trivial to get that. Um, basically, you look at the equation some more. Uh, this one was particularly easy because it was linear. This one right here uh, didn't have any sines and cosines, so the azimuths sort out really nicely okay, uh, in terms of the crank, the azimuths of the, of the crank, the uh, angle that uh, uh, is represented by this disk right there that's supporting the whole uh, Euler angle sphere. And then this one, well, that's more formidable. That comes uh, from this guy and using the uh, connections that we had made uh, earlier. Okay? And uh, one more, is, and, and we're home. Okay? So now all the crank angles are given in terms of other angles. And that's what we need. So let's try it out. That's the thing to, to do. And what I'm going to do, if I get, if I can get this thing uh, balanced, right, that's the trouble with it, the bearings are so good that it's well balanced. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set alpha equal 50, beta equal 60, and gamma equal 70. And then this uh, set of uh, equations here tells me that if I do that, I should be seeing the azimuth of the crank at 80 degrees. The uh, theta should be down to 33.7. And uh, this guy that I turned, that's how much I have to turn. I have to turn 128 and change uh, to get to that particular position from zero. Okay? So that's, that's the deal. Now, um, obviously, once you've made one of these things, you, you say, okay, well, what if I take these angles and substitute it into this one? Right? And, of course, that uh, first time I did, then work at all, but there's lots of ways to make arithmetic mistakes with trigonometry, right? So, uh, when we do that, well, here's what you get. You get uh, alpha is 50.007, so that's past the amount of precision that we're, we're carrying here. And then the uh, this uh, beta here comes out to be 60.022, again, pretty close to uh, what we're carrying. And finally, this last one here, um, 007 for James Bond, okay, is 70.007, okay? So, yeah, it works. You, you, something like this you definitely have to test, right? Uh, indeed. So, uh, what I'd like to do, okay, uh, I, I guess, is, is show you what happens or what it is that, um, that makes this, uh, uh, you know, possible. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to be setting this to a particular value, and I'll have to go around uh, in front. Maybe um, if somebody wants to volunteer uh, to read the angles off. The hardest one uh, to set is actually the uh, gamma down here, and uh, I need to put on my glasses so I can see uh, what it's actually reading. So I'm going to be setting the alpha at 50, and that's right about there. And then I'm going to be setting the beta at 60. And somebody maybe has to come up and see where 60 is going to be. Somebody and it's positive 60 you want. Um, would you volunteer to? Right. <laughs> and then you have to hold it because it wants to keep going. So is that a plus 60 or a minus 60? That's a, almost a plus 60. Plus 60 is right there. OK, well, just one way to hold it is to just Pinch that, or you okay. know, so pinch it on 60. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm screwing it up for you. Let me get back to 50 here, and uh, you go ahead and get to 60, okay? And then the question is, um, what do we want to set the gamma to? Well, 70, I'll do that. I think I can see uh, a 70 uh, nearby here. There's minus, there's plus 50, 60, 70. Okay, so uh, we're, gonna tr we're gonna try uh, to rotate that. Now, I may need somebody else here. We need to set this thing at the uh, angle that the cranks uh, are demanding. Okay, and that's something, what is the crank demanding on this? That's the italic theta of the, of the uh, crank angle. I'm going to just put Your it right lower there. lowercase reads 33.7. 33.7. So um, you can see the dial on your side. Yeah. And maybe you, <laughs> I'll, I'll just hold everything else and you go ahead and see if you can get it right so on. just move this. Yeah, and you have to undo that a little oh, bit to make it slide. Okay. But go ahead and put it there, and I'll, 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 crank, I'll crank down on it when you get there. So I'll go this way. One, a little bit there. Two, three. Oh. Let's do that. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Sure. And now, um, I think she's ready to go. I just apply it. Oop, I slid it a little bit, didn't I? I think that's yeah. okay. I apply it by plop. Okay, now the uh, crank is attached, and then the question is... You get it pressed. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to set it on zero, just to see how far I had to turn, because that's part of the, the equation, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take this guy over there and put the indicator on zero, and then uh, tighten it. Okay? Now. This is supposed to be a, a, a counterclockwise rotation uh, by uh, that 120 or whatever it was that we were calculating. So I'm going to start doing a clockwise rotation as though I'm undoing it. So you can let her go now. Okay. And let's just see if this works out. It looks like it's pretty close. It should come out to the zero 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 position. Unfortunately, I didn't. Uh, I didn't maybe set the uh, azimuths uh, quite right. But whoops, it slipped a little bit. Anyway, you see it's close. So basically, what we did was we went from uh, right here. That's the 128.68, and we went from that back to here, and that's where we start. So. That's, that's just the idea of, of what a crank does. To an original zero, zero, zero state, it takes it for a ride. And all during that ride, there's always a point, there, the, a point that does not move, right? I mean, if I just grab this sphere, and so as I was sitting here, and uh, just turn it arbitrarily, there are two points on that sphere that are where they were when I started. And that's where the crank goes. That's Darboux's point. Darboux's, whatever you want to call it, axis. It's an axis. Okay? So, um, th that's what we're seeing. Now, what I would like to do now is go the other way. And what you see when you do that, and what I have to do in order to get it started, after I've gotten this thing here, is I can swing alpha and gamma arbitrarily. If, if I'm right on, I'm not quite right on, so it's, it's fighting me a little bit. But I have to put that in such a position that when I turn this, I can get free. Otherwise, I just skid, okay? So I'm going past where we were when we were setting the dials, and now, I'm coming a good turn. back again to, and I have to be a little careful with it or it will slip on me. I am now at this point. I have rotated uh, by 360 de degrees. Uh, I mean, I, I'm at a, p a position where 
I have turned this thing uh, com uh, by full uh, two pi. But I'm not home yet, you see. I have to go through there, hold this thing, keep this thing going, this has me is going. Swing through that point right there, and then bring it back another good turn. to there. Okay, so that that's the uh, idea of uh, doing a full two pi rotation. Let's go ahead and show the pictures uh, in all of their um, glory. This is something I left behind, so I have to jam it. But there, there is the whole deal is I start here with that uh, dial facing away from the camera it comes around and now the ball has been rotated by 2 pi uh, actually right here okay the dial is now uh, opposite the, uh, the line for the board and continues you see another full 2 pi took 4 pi I had to go uh, 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 660 to this point Okay, 720 degrees to return this object, uh, and that's the way an electron rotates. That's the way any spin a half thing rotates. It has to be turned twice. Okay, let's have some fun with that idea. This is from Scientific American. Um, I'll go ahead and leave the original one there just to make a comparison. But when this came out, this is a long time ago, 75, when I first saw this, and it caught the attention of a lot of physicists. And you go to a meeting, and, and they, they, for some reason, they wanted to explain this uh, to, to everyone. And to do it, they would take their belt off, okay, and hold it on the table or do something with it. And um, their, their pants sometimes noticeably would slide down, <laughs> but they would be so happy to take their belt off and show this maneuver here, okay? As if that explains anything. But the, what's neat about this is it's got real practical applications, uh, which are, um, you know, very important for certain experiments. If you've got uh, some machinery that you want to put uh, some uh, heavy current uh, into a rotating frame, you would think that to should use a, uh, a brush and a commutator to transmit the power at the axis, right? And that's you know the way a lot of DC motors work that way. But you would have to do that. You don't have to do that. You, this gadget allows you uh, by rotating something uh, uh, half as fast as you actually want to rotate, carrying the, the wire around in such a way that it never it never gets twisted. It, it gets twisted this way, and then it gets twisted back. Okay. And then to add to uh, this, somebody discovered an optical version of this with just a, a, a set of four prisms and then one more uh, to uh, project. If this was a bright table here with an arrow on it, that arrow would not move as you rotated this thing four pi. That's cool. That is really neat. Now the question is, uh, is there an easier way to demonstrate this? And it turns out every high school majorette knows how to do this. Um, I wish I remembered to get a glass of water, but just imagine that I have water in this, okay, and I don't want to spill it on my uh, dirty clothes. And uh, I'm pointing uh, my fingers at you now, and without letting go of that and without breaking my arm, I'm going to rotate it by 2 pi. And I'm going to keep on rotating it by another 2 pi. Okay, high school majorettes do this, right? And male majorettes do it too, right? I mean, this is part of their, their performance. They do it with fire on both sides mm -hmm. and at high speed and manage to survive. So the, the, this is, a, a, you know, a, something that's going on in space and time uh, that we need to know about, know more about. Okay, let's catch up on all of these uh, 
slides here and go and look once again at uh, something that, that I would hold up for you as a really quick way to find eigen solutions. And I'm going to zip through this. Right? There's some, something else for you to read uh, on your own. It's described uh, in the textbook as well as in this lecture notes. The lecture notes are a little clearer and later. But the basic idea is um, if you have a Hamiltonian uh, that you're interested in finding the um, eigen uh, solutions to, um, we of course can re resort to our projection operator method, right? But projection operator method to arithmetic, if you've got any of this stuff in there, uh, is, you know, a little bit long, uh, a little bit bothersome, you're in a hurry particularly. And uh, so what we do here is have these steps using all the stuff that we've just uh, uh, figured out um, using the Euler um, and Darboux uh, angles. But we kind of know what the eigenvalues uh, are uh, fairly easily. That's a, uh, an easy write-down here. It's basically that. Those are the eigenvalues that you get very quickly. And this is a kind of diagram that I'm asking you in know, today's homework to draw for the uh, you're asked to do some uh, fairly simple uh, coupled oscillators, okay? And I put the numbers in there so that they're real and integral. So if you're not getting real and integral uh, values at various points, uh, go back and find the mistake. Anyway, um, there's this uh, frequency right here we're going to be calling omega zero. Then there's omega, big omega, this is uppercase omega, the one that goes with uh, things that happen in three dimensions and the omega over two is just halfway see so we're going to be getting a beat note at omega but then really in spinner space it goes half as fast this is the the beat that I talked about which is the difference in frequency uh, over two okay so it, this little geometry um, is a key a part of the eigenvalue uh, description and the physics that goes with the beats that occur uh, when you mix those two uh, states so that they can be uh, or will be. Okay. Now the uh, rest of it, the part of getting the uh, actual uh, vector, the state vector that is the eigenstate uh, for uh, this, that involves uh, the, well basically the arc cosine of uh, sigma b over the total omega uh, there. So it's, it's that that uh, eventually gives us uh, everything to the complete eigen solution. So um, after you've found uh, the, these uh, uh, Darbu angles that go with this particular uh, eigen state, uh, then alpha, beta, the Euler state, and uh, phase. Phase is not a, a necessarily uh, of interest. Uh, unless you're doing quantum information theory, and then uh, it is very much of interest, uh, that uh, comes uh, from there. But the basic idea, you see, is uh, in order to find a particular, uh, to find an eigenstate uh, uh, for uh, this thing, say, say it came out uh, somewhere in the middle of that rotation that we were doing, okay, uh, the idea is um, just connect, disconnect this guy right here and then hope it doesn't move. And then what you have to do is put um, this thing over and down. I'm turning it's too many things at, at once here. O over and down. I have to go over. Uh, where am I? Yeah, there I am. I, I, this thing is so marked up. I don't know. But anyway, the idea is that if you apply a crank uh, right there on the, on the tip of the spin vector, just at that particular, and I'm pretty close to it anyway, okay? The idea is that all that would happen as time went on would be that the gamma would twist. Now, I didn't quite get it on that particular point. Let me try to do it better by just cheating a little bit there and then put it down. This thing's so marked up that the suction cups don't stick. But the basic idea is all it turns now is gamma. That's, that's the... Uh, the, the high energy eigen uh, vector uh, is that direction right there. 
So that's the picture that I uh, have you imagine uh, for uh, this thing. And then the other one is just flipped over on the other side. I can put the somehow get the crank down here, which I can't do uh, just because of the mechanics, but I would be turning it here the other way. So those are the two um, eigenvalues, plus and minus, and here are the two eigenvectors, just differing by a pi uh, on the uh, theta angle of the crank. Okay. So uh, that just gives you a feeling for uh, the power of doing this uh, sort of thing. So if you have to have a computer that has to figure these things out um, rapidly for hundreds of spins, or thousands or millions, uh, who knows what we're going to be dealing with in the quantum information if this stuff ever pans out. Um, we uh, would like to make everything uh, as, as quick as possible. So this is a, is a fairly foolproof way uh, to do that and get the phases right and everything. Okay, now, um, some other things that I want, this is what I call it, this is where you say, in 60 seconds can you do this, this, and this. Okay. You can try that out on the problem. Uh, get through the problem first and then come back and pretend you don't know the answer and see how long it takes you uh, to get in this particular. Uh, take that matrix and uh, get its eigen, eigen solutions. Uh, that's not such a thing we have to do that much more because we've got our computers to do all the work for us. But more uh, to the point is I'd like to show uh, the nature of the motions of these um, particular uh, cases. Now, the easiest one, and the one that you might even not even think of, is the A dynamics. So, uh, A type motion, okay, where I have here just a diagonal matrix, no coupling. But that's part of the story. This thing is just asymmetric diagonal, AD, okay? So basically what I'm asking uh, someone to do that is performing an experiment with this is effectively apply the crank to the z-axis, what we call the z-axis, or what Pauli calls the z-axis, we call it the a-axis, uh, and, and turn away. Okay. Now, be aware, this is a Stokes sphere and a couple of pictures sitting at different places on the sphere, you see. Every point on that sphere corresponds to an ellipse of a different shape and orientation. Right? It's, that's what's mapped onto that sphere. So when I uh, apply, um, and I'll just turn this particular simulation on uh, for this one and, and hope it works. Anyway, there's the, the frequency diagram if you were doing quantum mechanics uh, with this. But just imagine this is classical mechanics of a... Uh, oscillating thing. So A axis is tipped over here, but that's what you're going to get. And that's a little different from what we've been seeing. What we were seeing before were B type motions, just kind of like this, except that the the uh, square here is turned into a diamond. This is rotated by 45 degrees. Right. But that's what's going on here. That is uh, all there is to uh, this particular uh, Hamiltonian. Now, um, where are the eigenvectors? Well, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get one right about there. Right? And I'll get another one right about there. So they're real easy to find. Okay? Either I'm oscillating that mass or I'm oscillating that mass, the x and the y. So you'd say th this is trivial, but um, for optics, this is just as important as all the other possible states. In fact, these are usually the, the term, terminal of an optics experiment that's trying to get polarization linearized. Okay, uh, let me uh, make sure I don't use up the CPU by uh, pausing this. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead uh, on the next one here, just for comparison's sake for D type, B type motion, okay, and remember that one involves a rotation around uh, the B crank. Now in this particular case I decided to rotate around the minus B crank, and there's a reason for that. The reason is that the Hamiltonian that I'm working with here uh, 
for the ammonia that we'll talk about at the end of this lecture, um, almost always there's a minus sign there. Just as there is on the two problems I gave you, the K matrix that comes out of that, better have a minus here if this is positive. Right? If that's the Hamiltonian of the K matrix. Okay? So uh, that is um, necessary in order for us to get, and let's just there's a, a picture of what we're going to get, but it'll be moving. Uh, let's just click on it and see if it works. And now you ask yourself, where are the eigenvectors for this one? Pretty easy to find. They're on the normal mode axes. Okay? One of the uh, axes is just a little bit faster than the other. So the beats are pretty slow. Uh, for this one, but there is one mode where the masses go together and then there's a higher frequency mode uh, right here where they're opposed and it's higher frequencies you can see by the plot, but not by much because they don't have a very strong spring between them. Okay, so that that makes... Uh, up there. Now the, the fractions and all that kind of stuff, that's fun, but uh, that's something you can study on your own and play with uh, on these programs. Um, A, B, I guess we need C. That means I have to catch up uh, on um, this uh, particular uh, guy. Let's uh, go ahead here, go through these two, and then come out. Uh, there's, there's a discussion right there of the um, fractional uh, things. Let's see if I um, got this thing uh, right here. Now I want to say something about this particular one. This is the C type, circular Coriolis, etc., etc., beginning with C uh, motion. And this time we're going to be rotating around that green axis on the lower right hand side. And so um, let's go ahead here to the point where I can actually click on uh, that. Uh, thing is uh, there. While he's doing that, I should point out that the application Stokes plot is 90 degree tilted with respect to the lecture. See here, our C is oriented yeah. up. Yeah, we, all of our uh, Stokes plots have the A axis sitting where the X axis would be. Uh, the, I bet the, this would be called Z by Pauli's my Y and so on. But here, uh, what we're rotating around is this one. Okay. Yeah, and what are you well. getting? You're getting that beautiful motion that you get in the museum where they have a big pendulum hanging under the rotunda, right? The equation of motion for that is, depending on the latitude, it's cosine of latitude. Uh, this projection of the Earth's spin onto the plane of rotation, the Coriolis effect. That we've mentioned already that we haven't mentioned in this context. And no matter what uh, you pick uh, for a, um, a initial condition, uh, if you want to make it uh, something that has a, a shape to it, well, it'll make that shape, but then it'll proceed to rotate that shape, whatever it is. Whatever that ellipse is, that ellipse is going to rotate without changing its aspect ratio. Whereas the ellipse really got screwed in this diagram here, turned inside out basically, and so did it happen here. It's just that this one is right with the axis, this one is at 45 degrees. A whole bunch of things that we need to show before when you start to mix these together. Um, that's the Foucault pendulum uh, uh, trajectory that takes, uh, you know, hours to happen in the museum. You often have sand dropping out of a great big pendulum to make a track. This is a lot cheaper. <laughs> okay. Um, see if there's anything else I need to say. I think that's uh, fairly uh, clear uh, in what we're doing. Um, I'll bring this one to a pause as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring this guy back. Yeah, I mean, to escape. Oh, no, not escape. I'm going to just go like this and come back. Okay, so um, I'm going to jump ahead uh, through all of the ones that we did here.
what I'd like to show you, and we only have a couple of minutes here, so I'm going to sort of blast through this. Uh, there's what we just did right there. Typical uh, recession. Mixing A and B simply takes something that is at zero, like A, rotates it 45 degrees, finally ending up at that. In between that, we have something at an arbitrary angle, and of course we can go past that. So that, that's a simulation that is not too uh, uh, exciting, um, basically what we have here tipped. But this is the one that really deserves some attention, and we're not going to give it much of that because this really belongs with the, with the quantum mechanics. These are the eigenvalues that you have uh, to play with uh, in this um, uh, uh, situation here, where I can vary uh, the A value of a, a matrix, the diagonal value of the AD matrix, where I make this plus and that minus, that's as asymmetric as you can get, and then I turn on the coupling between them, and uh, at each point there, uh, you get a different uh, energy level depending on how far you've gone. If you want to actually transform this thing uh, from that uh, to, uh, and this is a, a rotation there, 45 degrees, if you want to go ahead and do that, you can. It's, it's worth knowing that when you apply uh, something that's written in the A basis uh, with that rotation, and it's the same rotation, this is the inverse of that, so it is a similarity transformation which gives you this, which is that you literally change the coupling parameter into the diagonal with a plus and minus just like it had before. And you take the uh, diagonal value, the A uh, asymmetry, and put it as a coupling. That's, that's a weird kind of symmetry that results. This is the picture of the ammonia that you would make if you were trying to copy of some chemistry books that do physical chemistry and talk about the inversion. And this is the ground state where you have a wave function with no node, an anti-node, right in between the hydrogens. That's uh, where it likes to sit. And it's a linear combination of being up and down with precisely equal amplitudes. Then the uh, transition state uh, is involves complex numbers, but total uh, inversion to the uh, excited state is this one, where there is a node as opposed to an anti-node in between the hydrogen, so the nitrogen is just not e exactly not there, but is more on the outskirts. So those are the two eigenstates. Uh, here's the ground state, here's the eigenstate, uh, anti-symmetric. Okay. Well, as you crank up the asymmetry, what you do as you apply an electric field to this uh, thing, th then you see the gradual uh, uh, adoption. Uh, it says, okay, you want me to go this way? And I'm imagining positive uh, uh, charging, a uh, positive electric field here. Uh, the PE, the potential energy, but it isn't, it's the dipole moment times electric field is the potential energy. And eventually, as I get out here and, uh, and the hyperbola starts to get close to the asymptotes, I get almost 100% uh, on that side, I move all the wave function over so that the uh, nitrogen is, is pretty much uh, pushed to the, uh, say, the top side of this uh, diagram right here. I should turn these diagrams on the side in order to match the graph here. Uh, or if I play electric field the other way, same thing happens. Now, what you need to know about um, quantum mechanics is the excited, the, the ground states, the uh, initial states, uh, sort of go along with the political winds, so to speak. These are the rebels. They go against the wind. You put the electric field and say, no, screw you, I'm going against the electric field. Right? That's what it does. Okay? And we said in an election where a lot of people do that and we're better for it. Okay? So that's uh, what we're doing now. You can try doing or, uh, second order perturbations, third order perturbations and stuff. This is where I show that perturbation theory, the ordinary kind, is absolutely useless. Remember when we got this, this, uh, the polynomials to fit a sine and cosine over many steps? That works. This doesn't. 
So this is part. This is the beginning of the problem, trying to make quantum mechanics obey polynomials. Um, it's, it's not going to do it. So ba basically, uh, I like to show pictures of the Dirac point. This is the name it's given when you have cones in a two-stage system uh, that is playing the, the game that we're talking about here. And uh, there is a, the, the section, the conic section, uh, in, are those uh, hyperbolas uh, that uh, we're, we're uh, looking at. And this is sometimes called, uh, used to be, now the Dirac point is taken over, but they both begin with D, the Diablo is a toy that you see in South America. I saw it in Brazil a lot. It's um, a toy that consists of one, something about like that, but with a little rod in the middle there to hold these two together. And then you have a string in between two sticks. You pick up a dial and you get it rotating by just turning. And it turns real fast because this is a real small uh, radius and you just go like that and it's already spinning like crazy. We don't have it in this country, but I think it would sell. <laughs> Good, good physics. Okay. Um, elliptical polarization. That's what happens when you uh, turn on all three uh, parameters. You get various things like this. And um, this is something you can do on your own. Now, these are 3D drawings that show where the spin vector would be going as this thing evolved. And this is an actual uh, trajectory. And then the, the, the surface here is just made out of ellipses that have been frozen uh, for a particular orientation. So you get a coordinate system for it. Uh, uh, well, it's called a torus, and when you look at this thing in 3D, you can see that it's a four-dimensional torus. But here's one that looks more like the kind of donut that you would actually eat if you were a, a policeman at the, taking a break. Uh, the thing is that it, it also has a hole going this way that you don't see in the policeman's donut. But a, a four-dimensional torus is really two spheres in four dimensions taking the form of, well, that's, close as, that's about as close as you get to it. And then you change parameters um, as you get to, to, to other ones that uh, I think probably this is the one that's clearest. If you look at that one 3D, you get, you get to have a feeling about the invariant torus of a classical mechanical uh, system. This is a classical mechanical system, very simple one, and it's got this topology. And that's stuff that we would do in a second course in mechanics, but here's a chance to get a look at it uh, without uh, going there. So you can plot things like that very quickly uh, by turning on all three of the A, B, C, and Ds. And I recommend you give it a try. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Now the rest of this, the whole rest of this, is if you're going to do optical polarization, very often people use this scheme, and this lets you go ahead and um, use our ABC stuff uh, on this. So there, there's still some relationships that you have to get uh, for uh, the phase lag rho and the other things. Remember this uh, business right here where we, we made orbits, right? Okay, so this is a case where the frequencies are the same. But then you change it and you get another ellipse and another ellipse and another ellipse. So this is all of the geometry that comes out there. And the question is, how do you relate those things to our alpha, beta, gamma, and then ultimately to uh, crank angles? We'll see, and that, it's not too hard to do. Uh, there's the relationships there. So um, this is a discussion of, first of all, using a uh, A basis. Then a C basis, the B basis is pretty trivial, but you do it. You just use this asymmetry balance and chirality relations, and you change uh, this, this, and this from a, I'm sorry, this, this, and this. Uh, we gotta look at this thing. You know, you take this guy right here and convert it to that, just using these equations. So you can read anybody's paper. So some people like to work in what's a C basis. Others like the bilaterally balanced basis. That's the raw uh, A basis right there. It's very easy to make conversion uh, between those things, and that's what's being discussed here. And this is how the, this is the geometry that shows you that. You get interpretation. Every point on this thing has a geometrical something going on in spinner space or in polarization, actual electric field space uh, that. that um, uh, you can take advantage of. 
Okay, well that's that's a whirlwind tour of uh, what I think is the beginning of some really neat uh, stuff that's coming up. Density matrices, you can read that too. I think I'll quit. We're just about five minutes over or so. And I hope you've enjoyed this part of the resonance story. The next one that we're going on Monday is really dangerous. You don't have to wear anything particularly uh, to class, but uh, if you do experiments with this one, look out. This is where the trebuchet gets its energy.